funding for B.O.J. Kangas Welcome to My Kitchen is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. A gourmet meal for two, featuring a perfectly proportioned standing rib roast, crisp salad, gigantic popovers, and a very Scandinavian dessert. Delicious recipes for a memorable meal for two. I'm B.O. Jakangas, cookbook author, food writer, columnist, wife, mother, and grandmother. I've spent my life learning about food and sharing my knowledge with others. It's given me a certain perspective on cooking, rooted in the flavors, traditions, and rhythms of life in northern Minnesota, and a passion for sharing what I know. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, the next one was the gourmet cooking for two, which I, um, I, it was sort of an idea that came off the top of my head, but it was because we, we couldn't afford to go out and eat, even when we were in California. We, we, you know, there are all these wonderful restaurants around, but we didn't have money to go out. I mean, we were just students. And so I, what we would do is, I would plan a, a meal and usually, when we were at sunset, it was leftovers from the kitchen. And they were really, really great. And so I'd, I'd tell the kids, all right, you know, you can have anything you want for dinner. You can eat anywhere you want. You can have a picnic under the table. And sometimes they did. And then Dick and I would have a nice little dinner for two. I'd set up the um, a, a card table with a as fancy of a tablecloth as I could find, and and uh, the fanciest dishes I could find, and and we would, and then we'd buy a half bottle or a little, t uh, what do they call it, a split of of Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, and have that with our meal, <laughs> and and anyway, so that was sort of the nugget of the idea for for gourmet cooking for two. I thought, well, okay, why can't we have a lot of uh, menus for for two? because uh, a lot of people needed that. And so that was, a, and uh, I wrote to Crown and they, oh yeah, that's a good idea. So we published that book. But I uh, devised this method of taking one rib of a standing rib roast and then I froze it. And then propped it up between two baked potatoes, two potatoes that would bake, and, and bake the potatoes and the rib roast from the frozen state all at the same time. And it all turned out perfectly well. And so that was uh, one of my, uh, an article I wrote for the magazine, as well as um, something that we enjoyed for gourmet cooking for two. So I want to show you how, we, how I prepared the one rib. Now, um, actually, last week I went and asked the butcher to cut one rib, and you'll see that the one that we put in the oven is a little thicker than the one I have right here. But these ribs are on sale now, so it's a, it's a good deal. Uh, we put, we have so about a tablespoon of butter, and we're going to add one, one um, crushed clove of garlic and about a half a teaspoon of salt. And we're going to add freshly ground pepper. That goes into it. And then we'll mix it all up. And then I have the one rib here. And I did uh, try out a, a single rib like this, and it works pretty well especially when you do it the way I show you. Turn that over and put the other half of the butter on the other side of the rib. Like so. And that'll be nicely flavored. Then we're going to take the rib and wrap it up in foil. in a nice butcher wrap and freeze it. That's why we can make it taste like a rib roast because it will stand up in the oven and it'll cook on both sides. Okay, this goes into the freezer. This one was in the freezer overnight 
Uh, it'll actually freeze in one or two hours if you really are, you know, wanting to to speed up this process. And here we are. And this is the nice frozen one rib that we're going to we're going to roast. And the trick to making it stand up is to take this foil and make a little prop for the for the meat so that it will stay upright in the oven. We don't want it to fall one way or the other. Actually, the thinner um, steaks will might flop over, but yeah, you just go in there with a pair of uh, tongs and straighten it up. Okay, so now this goes into my roasting pan, like that. And as long as we're roasting and we've got room, well, why not? Why not roast a couple of potatoes at the same time? So I will, these potatoes, I scrubbed these earlier. And, you know, olive oil is good for your hands too. And then we're going to sprinkle them with a little bit of lemon pepper, because I like that flavor. And we'll just rub it all over. Oh, that feels so good. All right, now, oh, before we, I put them into the oven, I do feel like I should poke the potatoes so that they don't explode. I've had them explode on me, and it's not too much fun. Well, next on the agenda, we, we're going to put together the dough for, or the, the batter for popovers, which is very same, the very same pa batter as what we would use for Yorkshire puddings. And to make the popovers, we need to have milk, flour, eggs, and then I'm adding a little bit of, of um, rosemary to the flavor, to add flavor. And uh, we need to mix it in a blender. This is the secret to getting the um, popovers to really pop well. So we're gonna pour the milk and add eggs. It looks like a very small amount, but it makes two nice sized popovers. And we're going to add two eggs. And we're going to add the flour. And we're going to add a couple of hefty pinches of rosemary to give a nice flavor. Now, another secret to making the popovers really pop well is to let the dough sit for a couple of hours at least, or maybe even overnight. And this makes exactly one cup of popover batter. Now, what I did was sprayed with cooking spray two of the jumbo size uh, muffin, muffin uh, cups. And I'll pour half into each one. And because the other muffin cups are going to be empty, I will fill them with water because I don't want to have my uh, muffin tins warp at all. This is kind of true whenever you're making um, cupcakes or anything and you've got an empty muffin cup or cupcake tin. Put some water in it just to save your tin. Okay, now we go to the oven. I've got the oven preheated to 400 degrees. In goes our one rib, and in goes our popovers. The biggest challenge I faced was trying to figure out what I could do that was as much fun as working at Sunset Magazine. That to me was my dream job. I would have stayed there, I'd be there yet today. We came back to Duluth, and then I, um, I tried to figure out what I could do that would be as much fun. Before I left, the, the people, the editors at Sunset were really, really nice to me, and they said, well, you know, you could do, you look up, there's a, there's a man by the name of something like Gino Paluccini in Duluth, and maybe you can find a job there. He had Chunking at the time. I was hired to be um, a food 
uh, product developer to come up with new food ideas. I work freelance and I got this call one day to say, I uh, said, well, you know, it wasn't from, it was from the, uh, one of the new product development guys. C can you come up with as many fillings as you can think of to fill what we call egg rolls? You know, it doesn't have to be Chinese. You, you can put anything in them. And so I came up with all kinds of ideas for fillings for egg rolls, like everything from, from um, cheeseburger to Reuben fillings to even peanut butter and jelly, because I knew he liked peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And uh, then I, um, I, six of the filling, five or six of the fillings that I came up with w had a pizza flavoring. I put pizza flavors in. And um, I fro you know, fixed these up and put them in the freezer. And, and I had two weeks to finish this project. And there were like 55 different fillings. And he, I was picked up by the pilot of his personal plane. And we flew to, Cape, to uh, Lake Capitogama where he had this gorgeous layout of a, looked like a beautiful resort. We landed on the lake. I had this cooler full of frozen egg rolls and went into the kitchen and started heating these up and w I made labels and sent them out. They were um, uh, tasting everything and jabbering as they went along. And then when I sent the pizza flavored ones out, all the talking stopped. It was totally quiet. And Gino says, pizza rolls, we were making Gino's pizza rolls, that was it. That was, that was the beginning. We finally sold the, um, the pizza rolls to Totino's, which Pillsbury, for I know it was more than 100 million. Now the next thing we're going to do is make a cake that, the same cake that I made with Martha Stewart. It's the Cloudberry Cake. And uh, we'll sh because cloudberries aren't always available, I'll show you what you can use instead. And, uh, but I want to go through all the little details of making the cake that make it simpler once you get, once you get the cake baked. We're going to line the um, eight inch pans with parchment paper. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to cut forms of the um, parchment paper. I'll cut, cut it out, cut out rounds, and we'll put the rounds inside the um, pans, like so. And once we get the, we'll have to cut, we'll have to cut the paper so that it fits. Some people do this a smart way by folding the, uh, folding the paper in half. And I'll do that with the second one, but you'll, you'll be able to see that. These are eight inch pans. And here, with this one, I'll just take and fold it in half, and then in quarters. And we'll get the round cut out. So that it will stay in the bottom of the pan, I'm going to spray the pan with a little bit of, of uh, cooking spray because the, the um, otherwise the, the paper tends to want to, to, to come out. And then it will be easier to remove the cake afterwards too, after it's baked. So now we've got our, our pans prepared, ready for the batter. And so the next thing we're going to do is make our batter. We start out with, uh, this is a cake that I learned to make from a girl who stayed with us. She was from Finland. And one day she came home from school. She was at going to school in Duluth here. And she came home, she says, my friend is having a birthday tomorrow and I'd like to make a cake for her. And so I said, great. You know, and I showed her where everything was, where all the measuring ingredients were and everything else. And she goes to the cupboard 
and she pulls out three tumblers, identical tumblers, and she cracks six eggs into one of the tumblers, and then she fills the other two tumblers, one with sugar and one with flour. So they're all equal amounts. Well, what I've done here is I cracked six eggs into a measuring cup and measured a cup and a third of eggs. We start out with the eggs. And they need to be at room temperature because eggs will, will absorb the moisture or the, the heat from the, the room. And if, it, if the eggs are really cold, they won't whip as well. So we put them into the mixer. We'll add a little pinch of salt. And then we're going to add about a teaspoon of lemon juice. And then uh, we'll add the sugar very gradually. We're going to add a teaspoon of vanilla. Now we can, we can turn the mixer down to low. Doesn't that sound good? And we're going to add a cup and a third of flour. Come on. One cup and one third cup. I did this with Martha Stewart. It was really, really fun because she, uh, she made, makes similar cakes. I saw one on, on TV the other day. And it's real similar, but this is, this is even easier. This is so simple because it's only like three ingredients. Now we take this fluffy batter and we divide it between two, our two uh, cake pans. And I like to use a nice big spa spatula for scraping the bowl clean. And I always try to divide it evenly, but I don't always make, manage to do that. Now this goes into a 350 oven for approximately half an hour. Here's the baked cake. It didn't rise much in the, uh, in the oven, just a little bit, just enough to give it a nice texture. You can always make these ahead, wrap them up, put them in the freezer, and use them another day. But I did these early, and I'm going to loosen the cake from the pan. Then we need to whip some cream. And I'm gonna take about a cup and a half of cream and we'll whip that. And we'll gradually add some powdered sugar, about a half a cup. And we'll put about a, a teaspoon of vanilla into the whipping cream. I want to make four layers out of this. So I'll cut this right in half. And we'll take our rum and moisten the cake a little bit with some rum, like so. And then we'll take some of the cloudberry preserves. And like I said, you could use um, apricot preserves. Or you can alternate. You could put apricot on one layer and cloudberry on the other. So that makes a nice dessert. And then we'll take some of the whipping cream and spread that in. Okay. And then we'll take the cake and layer and put it on top. A little bit more rum, like so. I started out with about four tablespoons of rum. And let's switch over and use the apricot preserves. You see, they're just about the same texture. Okay, next comes our rum. And then a little bit of cloudberry.
This would be the piece de resistance on the, the Finnish or Swedish coffee table. Now, I'm going to finish off the cake by putting the rest of the whipping cream over the top. And I kind of, now I'll see, I might have too much here, but I kind of like to just uh, leave the layers showing so I have a nice thick layer of, of whipping cream on top. This can go into the refrigerator over, you know, for a few hours. I'll put a little bit over the edge here because it kind of looks nice that way, I think. And of course, in the summertime when we have raspberries or strawberries, I just decorate the top with more berries and fruit. So here we are. We've got our dessert. When we moved to Duluth, we thought, boy, Duluth needs a good Scandinavian restaurant. And we started looking around. We had friends who decided they would like to be in on it, and that would be, that would be uh, a, a good idea to start a restaurant. And they looked around, and they found this place called the Royal Inn up at uh, Mount Royal. And we decided, well, I went up there and I looked in the kitchen. It was all, it, all they had was a grill, a small refrigerator. We decided, okay, we're going to give this a try. So I went home and wrote 36 recipes for dinner burgers. And uh, those were, that was our menu. And, but then, and I w we were trying these out and I was serving them to their friends around the table and we were saying, what should we call this restaurant? We had all kinds of ideas, the iron skillet, this, that, the other thing, the black bear. <laughs> yeah, but then someone said, you know, the problem with that building is it looks like somebody's house. Hey, that's a great idea. <laughs> so we named it somebody's house, and it turned out to be a good idea because we didn't have any money for advertising, and when pe the bread, the you know, word spread that there's a restaurant called somebody's house, and people would say, well, we're going to go out to eat at somebody's house. Well, whose house? You know. So that was how it went. Well, the next thing we're going to do is make a very, 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 very simple salad. Um, when you, We're only making a salad for two people, and so I don't want to mess up too many dishes, and I just do the salad dressing, the vinaigrette, right in the salad bowl itself. So I'll take a little bit of, of mustard and a bit of balsamic vinegar. This is um, espresso flavored balsamic vinegar, which is kind of fun. We'll drip it a little bit in there. And then we'll, we'll drip in some olive oil so that and, uh, until it gets <coughs> mixed in pretty well. This is a rather, I mean, it's a sim kind of a simple salad, but it's what you could do so easily, and you can vary the flavors all you want. And I'm going to put a little bit of honey into this, just to counterbalance the tartness of the vinegar. Just a tiny bit. And we're going to add salt. And we're going to add some pepper. I like pepper. Okay, and we mix that in really well. Then in the summertime, I would go out to the garden and pick fresh, fresh uh, variety of greens, or go out to farmer's market and get a variety of greens. Found some really good ones there. But these are fine because they're, they're all ready to uh, serve. They're washed and ready to go. You, you really, you know, once you get these things, you have to be sure you use them within a couple of days because they tend to, they tend to get all soft and mushy. And then we're going to mix that in with the green, the vinaigrette, the greens with the vinaigrette. And so that makes a really nice salad right there. Let me taste that and see. Hmm. I like that. That's good. And that's all we need for two people. We've got the, the potatoes that are done. We'll put the potato on the plate. 
and then unwrap the standing rib roast we have for two people and that's had a chance to cool off already and then we're going to simply cut it into slices Ooh, it's beautiful. Now see the inside of that? I like it rare, or what they call medium rare. And if one side's a little bit bigger than the other, I give that bigger side to Dick. Bon appetit. Next time we'll master the basics with perfectly roasted chicken and garden vegetables, savory garlic, aioli, and crisp French bread from scratch. There is always something delicious cooking in my kitchen. I'm Bio Jacangas. See you next time. Funding for Bio Jacangus Welcome to My Kitchen is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.